Music for me started at a very, very young age. I have uh, got pictures of me uh, uh, when I was two and three and four years old, standing around singing Glen Campbell songs. I, uh, I was a big fan of the Glen Campbell Big Time Variety Show, which was, I guess, the early 70s. So I was born in 68, so I was right there in that. And, and uh, my mama used to tell everybody that I, I, I would tell people that I looked like Glenn Campbell and sounded like Charlie Pride. <laughs> God, I don't think it would have worked the other way. <laughs> but I always parted my hair like Glenn. And, and so I, I, I grew up singing in church. My grandmother was Pentecostal, and, and I spent a lot of time with my grandparents down in East Texas when I was young. And I went to church a lot with her and, and uh, just really got into live music. And, you know, all the way through school and church, even young, I, I remember in kindergarten, my mother remarried and moved to Southwest Arkansas when I was, you know, like four years old. I remember uh, when I started kindergarten, they had a uh, a Christmas program uh, at school. We had three little small kindergarten classes, and uh, uh, for our, our parent day program, they had little bulletin boards set up around the room. They probably had five of them, and uh, uh, so she divided the class up in little groups, and they had a song picked for each theme on each bulletin board, and the kids would sing that song correlating to that, that particular board. and. Uh, I sang so well that she put me with every group because I was the song leader even at five years old. So it's, it's just been that much a part of my life as far back as I can remember. My dream of Nashville was a, a pretty defining moment for me at the age of 12. Uh, I'd been into Merle Haggard somewhat and, and had started playing guitar around a little bit. Uh, and George Strait hit in the early 90s. It was that time period when that Texas sound was really starting to take hold. And uh, it was just like that moment, I remember at 12, that you know I started telling people that I was gonna go to Nashville and be a star. I mean, at 12 years old. And you know, uh, until I drove into town in the fall of 1990, I'd never been in the city before. So that dream was there a long time. We never took family vacations here. I'd never been, and it was, it was pretty terrifying making that move by, my, by myself, but it was, it was that lifelong dream that I'd had. When I came to Nashville, I'd been playing in a circuit band in Louisiana for a couple of years and just decided to make the move. But I, have, I was so focused when I got here, so everything to me was about getting positioned in the right place and meeting the right people. I was out just about every night, you know, not hanging out partying, but I was, I was meeting songwriters and I was meeting road musicians. I, I never really hung out at the touristy places. I always went to a where the, the road musicians were hanging out. I wanted to be inside the real working part of the music business. I remember getting here in September of 1990, and by December of that year, I'd uh, gotten a pretty steady gig on the weekends at a place called Live at Libby's over in Kentucky. Uh, just a little steakhouse opera kind of show. They had a, a live band, and uh, every Saturday night they would have uh, an opening portion of the show where young acts would do a, a two or three songs with a house band, and they'd have an intermission and then a headliner. But the great thing about it was there was a radio station there called WBVR that broadcast back into Nashville the entire live broadcast every weekend. Uh, so by December of that same year, I'd managed to, to get a reoccurring spot on that show um, in, in between working part-time jobs and everything else, paid a little bit of money. Uh, and I just happened to be there when uh, some executives from Atlantic Records came up to see a, another artist that was on the show that particular time and liked me better and the wheels started turning. So, you know, from the time I got to town to the point where I recorded my first album called Sticks and Stones, it was about seven months, which is, and to, to say that I didn't know anybody when I came here, I mean, I'd never even been in this town before. To show up like that and be able to have a record deal, a major label record deal in seven months is pretty phenomenal. Different favorite songs for different reasons. Uh, Sticks and Stones will always have a special place to me because it was the very first one and it, it was life changing for me. It changed my life and put my career on, on track and, and took me to the place where I, I always dreamed I, I was supposed to be. Uh, Alibis was a very special single because it was, it was that first really, really big impact record that I had and, and it was a time in my life where I was young and it was all so exciting and I have really fond memories of that period in my life. Uh, I See It Now was one of my personal favorites. 
because of the the lift of the melody. It's still one of my favorite things to sing every night. It's just got such a, a sweet emotion to it. I just really connected with that song in a way that I, I don't think I ever did anything else. And I, I felt like I've connected with most of the things that I've done over the years, but that one was special to me as a vocalist. Uh, but out of all that, Paint Me a Birmingham, big, find out who your friends are, huge record for many different reasons from a business side, being able to do what we did impact-wise on my own label, that was a really big success piece for me. But, you know, time marches on. That one song, to me, is, is one of the best written, written pieces of art that I ever got my hands on. It speaks so much about life in three-plus minutes. It covers several generations of a family. It was just well crafted, you know. That was one of those career songs that that you know even successful artists could spend a lifetime searching for and never find. It's a it's a strange time for the artist of my era. You know, obviously the majors in radio are moving on to another place, uh, but secondary radio has been great to me, and and uh, uh, I love uh, satellite radio. We've got a lot of great relationships there, and. We're uh, spending a lot of time developing a better rapport with Spotify and Sirius and the streaming avenues that we have available to us. My fan base is huge, and, and uh, um, obviously I wish that we were able to get more mainstream radio airplay, even with all the stations that we have, but it's just such a different time. Um, I just don't know if those doors are going to be open, not only for me, but for a lot of us. I mean. I can't remember the last time I heard a new Ronnie Dunn record on the radio or, or any new Alan Jackson. I mean, Trace Atkins is going through the same things. It's just a, there's been a changing of the guard in the industry, and, and it's moved toward the, the Jake Owens and the Jason Aldeans and those guys, and I love them. I'm proud for their success. And, you know, and I remember when I was starting out, the same kind of marker was thrown down and, and Haggard and Waylon and all those guys weren't getting airplay anymore. I just, in my mind, I'm not that old yet. You know, I just don't feel like I'm at that place yet. But the great thing about the day and age that we live in is that we have access to social media and we have ways of reaching that that audience out there. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sit around and be negative and be frustrated about what I can't do. I'm always trying to look for a more positive way to do the things that I can and continue to grow my fan base. My first introduction to McPherson came uh, through my fiddle player, Joe Caverly, and uh, he had made some relationships with you guys, and uh, he just wanted me to kind of check it out, and uh, I remember playing one for the first time. I've had a lot of different endorsements and things over the years, um, but I had never played a guitar that felt so comfortable. The neck thickness, the tone, uh, the intonation, the way it played up the neck, uh, I just felt like it was uh, a step above everything else that I had ever been exposed to. Uh, and uh, when I got my first one that was made for me, I was literally blown away by how good it sounded, plugged in and, and mic'd. It was just so consistent across the board. Uh, I've been extremely happy with it. Uh, you know, I can't imagine ever uh, not playing a McPherson again. It's been that impressive and an instrument to me.